Hello everyone, I'm Frank Harrell. I welcome you to session 13 of Biostatistics for Biomedical Research. Uh, we've taken a break so you can catch up and now we're back to almost weekly sessions. Uh, the notes that we'll be uh, using today are, are the beginning of chapter 10 of the BBR notes um, and the version of the notes that I'll be referring to are, uh, is from March 4th, uh, 2020. Uh, as always, if you're watching this on the YouTube live premiere, uh, set your chat box to the live chat so that you can see the uh, most recent questions and comments, and please post your uh, questions there. And if you're watching this offline, uh, go to the dedicated topic on uh, datamethods.org to post your questions and comments. Um, also, if you have a very short question, uh, you can just uh, uh, go to Twitter and tweet it. Uh, my Twitter handle is f 2 Harold. So today we're going to talk about uh, regression modeling uh, in, in the usual sense of parametric regression, such as ordinary uh, linear regression. We start with uh, a list of reasons why we uh, like to use statistical models such as regression models, and we'll contrast regression with some of the alternatives such as stratification and matching and attempt to show you that regression is more general and it solves more problems and it creates fewer problems, uh, and that's why we are so fond of statistical models. Uh, also, they're quite versatile, as we've already seen in earlier sessions when we've already introduced semi-parametric models such as the model version of the Wilcoxon test. And we've also talked about logistic models for the case where the predictors are categorical, and we'll come back to logistic models in more generality in a future session. So let's get started with our material from Chapter 10. What are regression models used for? Well, three of the big reasons are given here. Hypothesis testing, we've seen that they generalize statistical tests estimation and prediction, uh, but we also use statistical models for many other things. Um, we can increase power and precision for assessing the effect of one variable by adjusting for the effects of other variables that partially explain the variation and the outcome variable y. Uh, this is uh, applicable even in a perfectly balanced uh, randomized study explaining more outcome variation is always a good idea. We also use regression models for confounding, for confounder adjustment, getting adjusted estimates of effects, adjusting for confounding. Uh, and we use regression for a variety of auxiliary analyses, such as checking uh, whether an existing score adequately summarizes component variables. For example, if you wanted to see if body mass index adequately summarizes height and weight for predicting your outcome, you can fit a linear model in log height and log weight and see if the ratio of the coefficients is minus two, as is dictated by the body mass index. And then a very much underused uh, uh, aspect of regression modeling is checking for uh, uh, change score properties and checking whether change or an average or the most recent measurement is what you should be emphasizing. Uh, researchers are very quick to assume that the change from baseline uh, or say the change from uh, one year before randomization to, to randomization is what's important uh, to the subject. Uh, but it, it's often the case the most recent measurement is more important than the change. Uh, but you can just test that and find out and let the data speak for themselves. So you can fit a model containing body weight measure one year ago and at the time of treatment initiation. And then um, if the coefficients of those uh, two variables have a ratio of minus one, then a simple change score uh, might be an adequate summary of the two weights. Um, if the most recent weight is all important, then the coefficient for the weight measure one year ago will be very small. Uh, so by, by estimating those two coefficients, you can learn a lot and you can let the model sort of self-model how to analyze the starting point and the ending point. 
You can also use models to develop new summary scores uh, guided by uh, how they predict outcomes. Uh, so here's an example where we might use a regression model. You have an observational study comparing uh, patients who receive treatment A and those that receive treatment B. Uh, and we find that females are more likely to receive treatment B than males, so we need to adjust for sex. The regression approach would fit a model with the covariates or predictors. In this case, there's only two, treatment and sex. And so when you estimate the treatment effect, that effect is adjusted for sex. There is a non-regression approach, which is stratification. And so stratification might involve getting the subset of males and calculating the B minus A treatment difference, and then doing likewise for females, and then taking the average of those two differences. So that would be fully adjusted for sex, uh, just as a regression model would do. Um, but what if the variable you want to adjust for is a continuous variable such as age instead of sex, and you find that the older patients tend to get treatment B? Well, the regression model uh, would be a model with treatment and age in it, and then our treatment effect attempts to estimate the B minus A difference at any chosen age. Age is a fixed covariate, is something we're conditioning on. So that would be giving you an age adjustment, uh, assuming the model is a well-fitting model. For example, if you assumed age has a linear effect on the outcome, uh, it really does need to have approximately a linear effect. Now, what would be a stratification approach to this problem with adjusting for age? Well, uh, we would divide age into fifths, so we would calculate the quintiles and divide the age into five groups of equal size. Within each quintile, compute the B minus A difference and average the difference to get an almost age-adjusted treatment effect. I say almost because it's not adjusting for age because there is residual variation of age within each of these intervals. And this is a real problem with using quintiles or any sort of grouping, especially if you're keeping the sample size constant across the groups. Uh, because, for example, the outer, the outer fifths will be much wider uh, to capture an adequate sample size because the distribution is usually more concentrated in the middle. So you're not actually adjusting for age, you're just semi-adjusting for age. Now what about a matching approach? Well with matching, uh, you may say for each patient on treatment A, let's find a patient on B within two years of the same age. But if there's no match, we'll have to discard the A patient. If we um, use a, a patient from group B uh, as a match, uh, we, in most matching algorithms, we will not use that patient again, and we'll discard patients from treatment B who were not needed to match on one from treatment A. Uh, and then after doing the matching, you do a match pairs analysis or paired t-test. The sample size is greatly reduced uh, with this procedure of pairing it down to pairs, um, and that will um, decrease your power. Uh, more about that in a little bit. So this section goes into a little bit more detail about the, uh, the alternatives to regression of stratification or matching. Um, so some ways that you can hold one variable x1 constant when you're estimating the effect of another variable x2, in other words, we're doing covariable adjustment, well, you could experimentally manipulate x1. And so in certain animal experiments or uh, tissue or cellular level experiments, you can actually do that. Uh, another alternative would be to stratify the data on X1 and for each stratum, analyze the relationship between X2 and Y. Or you could form matched sets of observations on the basis of X1 and use a statistical method applicable to matched data. The choice of the appropriate method is not always obvious there. Or you can use a regression model to estimate joint effects of X1 and X2 on Y. And then the estimate of the X2 effect is essentially the X2 relationship on Y prime, where Y prime is Y after you subtract the X1 effect. Uh, this only is true for linear models, as we're talking about in this chapter. Uh, but you can calculate residuals from um, regressing out the first variable and you can analyze those residuals against the second variable to get an adjusted analysis. But we'll usually 
do that in a more straightforward way by just by just having the one unified model. Now stratification and matching are not effective when x1 is continuous or there are many x's to hold constant. It gets just very hard to do. Now matching is typically uh, something that you use before data acquisition is complete uh, or when the sample is too small to allow for regression adjustment. For example, you might have uh, 100 subjects and you think that it's important for a certain analysis to adjust for their occupation. These 100 subjects might come from 40 different occupations and we really can't have uh, 39 indicator variables in a model to adjust for 40 possible occupations. We might match people on occupation to do a matched analysis. Um, uh, but usually matching is only very effective when it's done before you acquire the data so that you don't have to spend money um, on extra observations that are not as informative in the analysis. Um, now matching after a study is completed usually results in discarding a very large number of observations that would have been excellent matches. This really happens when you're doing a like case control matching and uh, you have an abundance of controls and you, uh, you have many fewer cases and if you do matching you're going to be excluding a large number of controls that are just perfectly fine controls that do increase to your information base. So methods that discard information, they lose power and precision. And the way we are discarding observations is actually pretty arbitrary, and that damages the study's reproducibility. Um, most matching methods depend on the row order of observations. In other words, if you randomly sorted your data, you'll get different matches. And this also puts reproducibility into question. And then there's no real principled, unique statistical approach to analysis of matched data uh, that's, that arises in this fashion. And so all this points to many advantages of regression adjustment. Uh, you can use stratification and matching to adjust uh, for a very small set of variables. Um, and so there, there are uh, some cases where you can do it, but not that many. Uh, now this table below here just shows what happens when you're doing matching and so uh, we have uh, uh, subjects age 30, 35, 40, and 42 who are not exposed to a certain um, treatment or certain condition and those that are who are exposed and those who are unexposed they have ages 29, 42, 41, 42 and so what would a matching process look like? Well, you might have three match sets, and the first one might have the 30-year-old um, in the uh, exposed group matched with a 29-year-old in the unexposed group, and then match set two might match the 40-year-old exposed with a uh, 41-year-old unexposed, and then match the 42-year-old exposed with the first 42-year-old unexposed. And so we have this other 42-year-old unexposed subject who would be a perfectly good match. And there are many-to-one and many-to-many -many matching algorithms that are out there, uh, but they make the analysis very complex, and these many-to-many -many matching algorithms are not used very often. And you can see that subject number 35, we didn't really have a match within a decent tolerance of plus or minus two years. So we don't know what to do with subject number 35, but 35 is between uh, 30 uh, and 40, and so you could argue by just simple interpolation, we should be able to use that 35-year-old exposed subject. And so you see there's some problems with matching, uh, and if you wanted to be exactly honest about your result, you would have to say, because we can't uh, match on the 35-year-old, that the entire analysis has to be declared as conditional on the age not being in the interval uh, 30, 36 to 39. Uh, the n is, is reduced by discarding observations, even ones that are easy to match, and we've already talked about the row order problem. Um, and so I, I don't think from a scientific standpoint that matching is very satisfactory.
Now we turn to, uh, again, purposes of statistical models, and we go into a little more detail. So we mentioned hypothesis testing, where we might be testing for no association uh, or no correlation of a predictor or an in independent variable with a response or dependent variable. That would be an unadjusted uh, hypothesis test. Or we might test for no association after adjusting for the effects of other variables. Uh, estimation, on the other hand, involves a couple of different interesting things. One is to estimate the shape of a relationship between a continuous predictor and the outcome, and then to estimate the magnitude of that relationship. Um, we might estimate the effect on the response variable of changing a predictor from one value to another. So if you wanted to estimate uh, the effect of of uh, some other outcome of changing cholesterol from 200 to 250, this would be something really suited for uh, a regression model. And then prediction, everybody knows we use these models for prediction. We're, res we're predicting response tendencies. In other words, long-term averages, or in logistic regression, we're predicting probabilities. You can also use regression for continuous outcomes to predict responses of individual subjects, which is a much more difficult problem, as we'll see very explicitly uh, later in this chapter. Um, now, here's some um, other advantages of modeling. Uh, even when you're only doing hypothesis testing, where we might be tempted to use rank tests or permutation tests, um, the classical ones, uh, modeling has some advantages. You can't readily extend uh, rank tests and permutation tests to cluster sampling or repeated measurements. And then, very importantly, models generalize the test, so there's less to learn. We saw that in an earlier chapter when we uh, proposed using the proportional odds model as a complete replacement for the Wilcoxon or Kruska Wallace test. So the two sample t test. Uh, and ANOVA, or the case sample comparison, are just special cases of multiple linear regression. We don't really need to teach these separate tests. And as we just said, Wilcoxon and kruska wallace tests are special cases of the proportional odds model. The log rank test is a special case of the Cox model. Um, now, when you have a model, you can adjust for multiplicity if you think that's appropriate. And most statisticians have kind of a funny view of multiplicity. They, they get all excited about it in terms of adjusting p-values and making them bigger, but they don't recognize that the point estimates need adjustment for multiplicity. And so with a model-based approach, you can get p-values and point estimates adjusted for multiplicity. The, le the point estimates we adjust by using things like mixed effects models where a certain categorical variable with a lot of categories would be modeled as a random effect, and you're borrowing information across categories and moving them towards uh, the mean, and that really is a kind of multiplicity adjustment. Now, statistical estimation, as the example we gave in raising cholesterol, uh, really is model-based because there's no way to uh, get an estimate of raising cholesterol from 200 to 250 um, unless you had a million subjects and you had a couple of hundred subjects at exactly a 200 and a hundred or so subjects at exactly a cholesterol of 250. So uh, we just can't do that with stratification. A common mistake is to try to simplify the problem and say let's compare everybody uh, with a cholesterol below 225 with those with a cholesterol uh, above 225. And it can be shown that the uh, odds ratio or hazard ratio has no real meaning uh, when you do that. It has no possible interpretation, and it's easily manipulated by changing the enrollment criteria uh, to alter the cholesterol distribution of subjects who entered the study. Now, the adjustment of variables depends on how other risk factors relate uh, to the outcome. And we're almost always interested in adjusted or partial effects, not at unadjusted, also called marginal or crude effects. We want to condition on all information that we know so that we can compare like with like. Now, this is a little diversion that we're not going to spend much time on, which is nonparametric regression. And the main reason that I present this before presenting simple linear regression is that 
uh, linearity is not a very natural assumption to make for a continuous variable, and it's really the exception that relationships are, are linear. Um, and so you need to know that there are methods out there that have been around for a long time that allow relationships to be arbitrarily nonlinear, especially if you assume they're smooth. And one of those methods that's very flexible and very handy is nonparametric regression. And it's, it's like a moving average, except in, a moving average will be a moving flat line and uh, nonparametric smoother, such as low S, is going to be a moving straight line that doesn't have to be flat. So it's like a moving slope and intercept. And so this just shows what a moving average looks like when you have unequally spaced data. And you just, we have a window uh, of width, uh, three observations. And this just goes through to show you when you do the moving average, what is it you're estimating? You're estimating the average y at a given x that's at the, say, at the center of the group of three in the window that you're moving. Uh, you're moving, and, and you can have overlap between these intervals. That's perfectly okay. Um, but you see you have a problem with the outer values because if you wanted to estimate the average y when x is 8, uh, there's, no, there's no observation beyond that to average in to give you symmetry when you average in an observation from the left. That's really um, solved with a low S smoother. Estimates can be sensitive to the bin width, and so the moving linear regression, such as Cleveland's uh, locally weighted least squares or low S method, is really um, much preferred over moving average. Um, and it can also be used for binary outcomes if you exercise just a little bit of care. Uh, so um, here's an example where we have uh, an acute bacterial meningitis data set, and um, we are correlating total ponyl polymononuclear leukocyte count with the ratio of glucose in the cerebral spinal fluid versus the blood. Uh, these, are, these are diagnostic markers for bacterial meningitis. And so if we used uh, the lowest smoother to show the relationship between those two things, you see that the relationship is anything but linear. A linear regression would be misleading and it would just cut through here give you a very bad approximation to the true relationship. But this moving least squares, moving slope and intercept method of low S worked extremely well. Um, now this is using um, a different smoother called super smoother um, because we have a very sharp change in this particular relationship and the super smoother could, could uh, catch that change. This is age at admission to the emergency department for people with symptoms of meningitis versus the pr proportion having confirmed uh, bacterial meningitis as their final diagnosis. And we see a very, very sharp change where your risk is peaking at age one year. There's little tick marks up here to show where you have individual patients. And you see there's a, a large number of infants in this study. So we really trust these estimates here. Uh, so this shows um, how you can, an, another example of uh, estimating a relationship without assuming things that are linear. So keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this chapter because we're going to be assuming linear effects in the rest of the chapter and later we'll relax that using a parametric version of, of what we're doing right now based on uh, spline functions. So now we get into uh, the really the heart of simple linear regression. Simple meaning we have just one predictor. Uh, so we need some notation. So our first notation is the little y is a random variable representing the response or dependent variable. A little x is a variable representing the independent variable. Now we say random variable there, and that's maybe a little uh, misleading because we're assuming that the the numbers that we measure for x are constants. We're, they might have a distribution in the population. They would have, uh, but we don't really care about that distribution. We're conditional on the x's that we happen to observe in our sample. And for the most part, most part we're assuming these x's are measured without error. Uh, 
So what does it mean to condition on something? Well, it means to treat it as a constant, holding, holding it constant, uh, subsetting known values of the variable. And it also means if you were to make a scatter plot, you're slicing the scatter plot vertically. So this is a scatter plot of two continuous variables. And if we were to condition on x, notice x is a little bit discrete. Uh, condition on x, such as the values where the vertical dashed line it are, uh, means that we're taking a vertical slice out of this relationship between x and y. So that's all conditioning is in the single variable case. Um, and so now we need to have some notation for what it is we're estimating. We're estimating the expected value of the response variable as a function of x. Um, that e means expected value or long-term average or population expected value. And so the vertical bar means holding x constant or condition on x, taking x as a given. For example, we want the population average blood pressure for a 30-year-old. So x would equal to 30, and y, expected value of y given x, is that mean. So it's mean for a 30-year-old. Uh, and now we're going to have our model where we have, uh, we have a slope and an intercept. And our model is um, stated somewhere near here, which I'm assuming we'll get to shortly. Um, we're going to have an intercept and a slope. And the slope, um, you probably learned this early in school, the slope is the rise over the run. So how much does y change when x changes by one unit? Um, and so delta y over delta x is the slope. So if you were to raise x by one unit here, let's say this is one unit going across, how much does the mean of y increase? That is our slope of y on x. So simple linear regression is used when there's only two variables of interest, x and y. One variable is a response, one is a predictor, and there's no adjustment needed for confounding or between subject variation. We're this, the investigator is interested in assessing the strength of the relationship between x and y in real data units or in predicting y from x. And we're assuming a linear regression, uh, which is not necessary, but we're doing that just for now. A side note is if you really don't care to make predictions or to have a parametric formula representing the uh, curve that you fit, uh, then you can just assess correlation between x and y, and Spearman's row rank correlation would be a good choice in that uh, because it's very uh, robust to outliers, and it does not assume a linear relationship. So now we get into our actual model statement, and we're going to have two ways to state the model. The first is in terms of this long-term average or expected value of y given x, is equal to alpha plus beta times x. And our second way of stating the model is in terms of an individual subject's response. So the individual response is alpha plus beta x plus a residual or random error. So E is a random error representing the variation between subjects in Y even if you had the same x for two subjects. So E is used to capture subject-to-subject -subject variation that's not explained by X. For example, variation in blood pressure for patients even of the same age uh, is represented by the residuals E. We'll show shortly that those two models are equivalent. Now what are the assumptions of the model if you need to do inference? Well, the model assumes the normal linear model uh, that conditional on x, y is normal with a mean alpha plus beta x and a constant variance sigma squared. So that's one way of saying it. Or we could say the residuals are normally distributed with mean zero and constant variance. Those are really the same thing. And now let's get to the equivalence of the two ways of stating the model. The expected value y given x is if we take the second form of the model, expected value of alpha plus beta x plus the residual, 
Now, when you're taking the long-term average of the sum of things, that average is the sum of the long-term averages. So alpha is a constant, so its long-term average is alpha. Beta x is a constant, and then we just need to take the long-term average of e, but that is zero. We're assuming the residuals have a mean of zero. So the expected value of e is zero, and that means that when you start with a second form of the model, you get the first model. We are assuming, and this is a hidden assumption that you usually could not verify with data, that the observations are independent. They're coming from separate subjects, and the subjects are not competing with each other in any way, um, and we're not having multiple observations per subject, such as in longitudinal data. So we're in the univariate case, not the longitudinal data case. Next section is how do we estimate alpha and beta? Uh, so we need, first of all, a criterion for what, how we would judge estimates. There's many criteria. One criterion is to choose values for alpha and beta that minimize the sum of squared errors in predicting individual subject responses. So let A and B be guesses for alpha and beta. And let's suppose we have a sample of size n with these x-y pairs x1, y1 out to xn, yn. And now if we had this guess for alpha and beta of a and b, the sum of squared errors in using those guesses to predict y is just the sum over the n observations of the square of the error. And the error is the predicted minus the observed. Um, and so I should say here the observed minus the predicted. And so the observed is y sub i a plus b x i would be your predicted value. And if we take the observed minus predicted, square it, and add it up over all the subjects, we get the sum of squared errors. The values that minimize the sum of squared errors are the least squared estimates. This is what Carl Gauss devised uh, centuries ago. And here's the formula for the least squares estimates. Uh, we're going to let LXX devote, denote the sum of sort of x times itself, but centered. So we take x minus its mean, and we're going to multiply that by the same thing to get the square, and we're going to sum those squares. So this, you can see, is nothing more than the sample variance of the x's multiplied by n minus 1. So how dispersed are the predictor values? And now we have LXY. These are, this is a scaled version of the covariance between X and Y. Um, this is the numerator of the Pearson product moment linear correlation coefficient. So this is a scaled, uh, it's a, just a multiple of the uh, covariance. Now what is the covariance telling, telling us and how do we get a slope out of that? Or how do we get a correlation coefficient out of that? Well, the, the best way to think about it is if X and Y have a, have a positive association, then when X is above its mean, Y will tend to be above its mean, and this product will be positive. Uh, when X is below its mean, Y will tend to be below its mean, and you have negative times negative, you also get a positive. Uh, now, we're looking not just at whether something's above a mean or below, but we're looking at how far above the mean something is. And so if when x is, is far above its mean, y is far above its mean, you'll get a lot of weight in this calculation. Likewise, when x is far below its mean, if y is also far below its mean, those two negatives will give you a positive. You get a lot of weight in the calculation. So when x and y move together, you would say they're correlated, and that means your slope is going to be steeper. And then what is the formula for the slope? The slope is the covariance normalized by the variance. And so just to help that along, this LXY is going to be units of x units times y units. This is going to be the units of x times x. And so this ratio is going to be in the units of y divided by x, rise over run, which is uh, slope.
And so the covariance, when you normalize it for the variance in the, in the x's, you're going to get the least squares estimate of the slope in simple linear regression. And then once you have the slope, you can just solve for the intercept. The intercept is going to be y bar minus b times x bar. Uh, one thing that makes this happen is with uh, simple linear regression, the regression line is going to go exactly through x bar, y bar. So what would make least squares estimates optimal? Well, several things have to happen. The residuals will have to come from a normal distribution. The residuals all have the same variance and the model has to be correctly specified, for example, linearity holes. Uh, now, you'll hear people say that regression is robust if you have non-normality, uh, non and I don't think that's actually very true. Uh, you might get the average predicted value being very robust, uh, and you might get uh, confidence intervals being okay on the average, but they might be uh, wrong in both tails. Um, and so you, by, by being right on the average, that's just not good enough. We want, we want to be right in a covariate-specific fashion. And if you should have, for example, taken the log transformation of y before doing the regression, you'll find that your overall average is right, but all of your regression coefficients can be very wrong, and you'll make a lot of little errors. Uh, so I hope you will look at the uh, video here because get, this gives you um, examples where you can use the mouse and click various points and then find out what sort of curve fitting you get to those points and what is it sensitive to and how does it uh, act when things are not really linear. So really encourage you to uh, look at that video or to uh, actually load the script into R and play around with it and click your own points and see what least squares uh, comes up with, as well as other regression fits that are not least squares. Now we get into inference about parameters. And so uh, we're going to get an estimated residual because that's part of our inference, it's also part of our diagnostics. Uh, estimated residual is equal to the observed y minus the predicted y, and we use the caret over y to indicate a predicted value. What makes the residual large? Uh, it can be large if the line was not the proper fit to the data. It should have been a U-shaped relationship, for example, or if there's a large variability across subjects for the same X. You'll get residuals that are large if you have a lot of unexplained uh, variability in Y, meaning your R squared is low. Um, be clear on what you mean because it's often confused in the literature uh, what is goodness of fit, what is lack of fit. Some people call R squared a measure of goodness of fit. It's really, it's really not that because you can have a good R squared in a pretty bad fitting model and if you fit it better the R squared would be even better. So I need to distinguish goodness of fit and lack of fit and things like uh, predictive discrimination they, they mean different things. Um, and so it's better to think of lack of fit as being due to a structural defect in the model, such as linearity. Uh, and not to call lack of fit just a low R squared because you can't just can't predict any better in your predict, particular problem. So these are some formulas that are used in the inference and statistical test. This first quantity is the sum of squares total. This is just the sample variance of y multiplied by n minus 1. So it's the sum of squared uh, differences between the raw y's and the mean of all the y's. Sum of squares total. Sum of squared regression is just the variance of the predicted values multiplied by n minus 1. So it's a measure of how much the predicted values disagree with one another across subjects. If you have a powerful model, you want it to give much different predictive values for different subjects. And the more different they are, the more dispersion you have in your predicted values, the more powerful your model. So the sum of square differences between the predicted value and the grand mean of y is this measure of uh, 
strength of the model, and that is called sum of squares regression. Uh, you'll see some uh, textbooks uh, use SSR to mean sum of squared residuals. Uh, um, so beware, we're, we're using it to mean sum of squared regression. Sum of squared residuals, we're calling that the sum of squared errors. So the sum of y minus the predicted value, uh, we've already talked about it. That's our criterion that we minimize for solving using least squares estimates. And then you have these identities. The sum of squares total is equal to the sum of squares regression plus the sum of squared error which means if you had the sum of squared total and the sum of squared errors, you can subtract them to get the sum of squared regression. So you only need to calculate any two of these to get all three. The sum of squares increases in proportion to the sample size, so we need to be careful to normalize certain things for the sample size. Now, in we, when we do our analysis of variance table for regression, um, we talk about mean squares. So mean squares are sum of squares that are normalized for degrees of freedom. And there's a long history to this, and sometimes the idea kind of gets in the way, uh, except for the mean squared error is kind of magical because this is our estimate of sigma squared. So that is the sample conditional variance of y, conditional on x. And instead of dividing by n minus 1, we divide it by n minus p minus 1 because we're estimating, um, in addition to an overall mean like the intercept is sort of doing, we're estimating p regression coefficients. In the simple linear regression case, p is 1. Um, so the mean squared error, which is sum of squared error divided by the degrees of freedom of this quantity, is an unbiased estimate of the residual variance sigma squared, so it is a very special quantity. These other quantities are not quite as useful as they look, but they were important in the history of statistics uh, and is how the F distribution was uh, derived. So the mean squared regression is a sum of squared regression divided by its degrees of freedom, which is the number of parameters in the model, not counting the intercept. The mean squared total is the total sum of squares divided by n minus 1, which does have a pretty good meaning. Uh, it's the sample unconditional variance of y. So um, let's think about uh, what ANOVA is doing in the case of comparing two groups. ANOVA is, is, is the same as the t-test. It's just expressing it differently. And then when you generalize the t-test to more than two groups, you get analysis of variance uh, to handle that. And now in analysis of variance, instead of having a slope and an intercept, we have multiple means. The sum of squared regression is the sum of squares between. And so that is the sum of squared uh, differences between the treatment means uh, compared against the grand mean. Uh, so sum of squared regression is equivalent to sum of squared between treatments. The sum of squared error is equivalent to the sum of squares within treatments, summed over treatments. But for a, a regression, we get this kind of ANOVA table, and this is for the general case where we have p predictors, but right now we're just dealing with 1x, so p is 1 again. Uh, so this is the sum of squared due to regression is SSR. The degrees of freedom is p, so the mean squared due to regression is just normalizing that for p um, just out of tradition, no real compelling reason to do that. Um, and so we take the sum of squared regression divided by p, and that's our mean square. Then we get our error degrees of freedom is, is the number of subjects minus the total number of parameters being estimated, which will be 1 for the slope and 1 for the intercept. The sum of squared error uh, is, as we've said before, and then the mean squared error is the sum of squared error divided by its degrees of freedom. And then we get our total degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Just add up these two. And if you add up these two things, you get SST. And these do not add up. So the mean squared total is SST over n minus 1. That's not really, uh, these are not really a used part of the ANOVA table. Um, and then we get an F ratio for uh, testing the null hypothesis um, that the Y distribution is really one distribution. 
In other words, in ANOVA with multiple groups, the groups don't matter. In linear regression, the X doesn't matter. Uh, so the F ratio is the mean squared regression divided by the mean squared error. So you just take this divided by that, and that will give you an F statistic that has P and N minus P minus 1 degrees of freedom. More about that later. So statistical evidence for large values of beta can be summarized by this F ratio, uh, mean squared re regression over mean squared error. Large values of F um, are giving you an indication that the regression coefficient is large in absolute value. Now we move on to uh, estimating the residual um, standard deviation, getting the standard error of the slope, and then getting the t-test for the slope, which we're about to see is identical to using the f-test we just had, uh, and the t-statistic is just the square root of the f-statistic. So our first order of business is to get an estimate of the residual variance of y holding x constant. So this, in our scatter plot, uh, if, you, if you look back to that uh, scatter plot that we had, um, the conditional uh, variance of y given x is just the variance of y along any one of these verti vertical slices. And you can see that that variation in y conditional on x is much lower than the total variation of y. So this, when you project all of these points on the y-axis, you get the unconditional sample distribution of y. And the variance of this is, uh, the unconditional variance of y is much bigger uh, than the conditional variance of y that you get from these vertical slices. So this is what we're estimating now. So the, the sample variance, sample conditional variance, conditional on x, is denoted by little s squared sub y dot x. This was an old notation. Instead of using y vertical bar x, which might make a little more sense, the tradition in statistics was y dot x. So that is the estimate of the variance of the residuals, which is also the variance of the y holding x constant. And the estimate is uh, the mean squared error. And so that's an estimated variance of conditional distribution of y, also of the residuals. That's the same thing. Now, what is the standard error of the slope estimate? Well, the way that's calculated is, and you can see how central the residual variance is to everything, take the square root of the residual variance, which is our residual standard deviation of y given x, and divide it by the square root of LXX. So that's the sum of x minus x bar squared, and take the square root of that. And so the standard error of beta of b is is coming from the amount of uh, unexplained variation. The more unexplained variation, the higher the variance of the slope. But then the more variation you get in x, the lower your standard error of the slope. So think about estimating a slope over a narrow range of x. That line that you fit is going to swivel around easily in the wind. But if you had that line that was uh, getting weight from x that was dispersed way across a large range, you can see it's easier to fit a slope to that kind of variation in x. LXX will be very large, and you want LXX to be large. You want a lot of diversity in x to get a good slope estimate. Now the t ratio is equal to the point estimate of the slope divided by the estimated standard error and that has n minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom. For us right now, that'll be n minus 2. Now, as I said before, uh, there's a strict relationship between these two statistics, so it's an equivalent test. If you squared the t, you get exactly the f ratio we got above when p is 1. The reason we do the f is it handles p greater than 1, but the, the t doesn't uh, as easily do that. Um, the t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom is identical to the square root of an f distribution with 1 and n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So that's the numerator degrees of freedom for f. We have one parameter being considered other than the intercept, and then we have these residual degrees of freedom. 
And the t is identical to a two-sample t-test if x had only two values, let's say 0 and 1, and you fit a straight line to these two x values and you have multiple y's repeated at each of these x's, the difference in means is exactly the slope. Now next we get into beyond point estimate, we get into interval estimation. How do we compute a two-sided confidence interval for the unknown uh, slope beta? Well, we take the point estimate of our slope and we take that plus or minus the critical value of the t-distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom, and then we multiply that by the estimated standard error of, of the slope. This is very similar in form to how you get a confidence interval for the mean from a normal distribution. Now we often take, for some crazy reason, alpha is 0.05, and the critical value for t is going to approach 1.96 as n gets very large. But this is a symmetric confidence interval, very easy to compute. Now, what if you wanted, instead of um, a confidence interval for a mean, which uh, we'll be getting more to, you want a confidence interval uh, for prediction. Um, well, that will depend on what it is you want to predict. Because you might officially want to predict a mean, but you might instead want to predict uh, the outcome for an individual subject. Our estimate in either case would be y hat. So even though we might be estimating an individual subject's response, uh, we would still find that our best estimate, one that sort of has the best mean squared error, is the mean. So we use the mean to estimate an individual. We also use it to estimate a population mean. And so we'll state this as having two goals. If our goal is to estimate an individual response, we'll say we're predicting y hat. And if our goal is to estimate the population average or long-term average expected value, we'll call that e hat. So estimated expected value of y given x. Now, if you're predicting uh, y using y hat, the standard error of the predicted value for a given subject has the same component at the beginning, which is your residual standard deviation, and then it's multiplied uh, by this quantity, the square root of 1 plus 1 over n plus x minus x bar squared over LXX. Now there's a few things to understand in this formula. Um, and so if you're making a prediction at x bar, so if x is equal to x bar, this cancels out. Making a prediction of y when x is its mean, it's going to be, the predictive value is going to be y bar. Predicting y at the mean of x is the easiest task. It is the lowest standard error. That's why this gets small. If you want to predict at an extreme x that's far from the bulk of the data, you're going to be extrapolating. Extrapolation is dangerous, and this formula will give you a penalty for that. So how far are you from the mean of x in units of uh, normalized by LXX? And then this 1 is something that's there when you're estimating the mean. Uh, it's not there when you're estimating the mean. This 1 over n is what is also in the formula when you're estimating the expected value of y given x. Uh, now, if this 1 were not here, you would see that as n goes to infinity, since LXX is a sum of n things, it's going to blow up and go to infinity. This goes to infinity. This goes to zero. This goes to zero. So as n goes to infinity, uh, your standard error of uh, the mean, which doesn't have this 1 in it, is going to go to zero. On the other hand, um, for estimating an individual, as n goes to infinity, the standard error of the predicted value, predicted raw value, converges to sy dot x, which is greater than zero. So if you have any subject-to-subject -subject variability, no matter how big your sample size, you will never be able to make that subject-to-subject -subject variability go away with this one x. And so your precision in estimating an individual subject's response is going to be hurt by the subject to subject variability. In other words, how much does one subject disagree with another in their response even if they have the same x?
So what you're essentially doing when you're uh, making a prediction about an individual is, is you're taking the predicted mean and adding a random residual. That might be a predicted raw value. And those residuals are going to have a non-zero variance. Now, um, if we're predicting the mean using y hat, uh, we have a different formula that I already mentioned, uh, where you have the same residual standard deviation, but you don't have that one underneath the square root. So you see that this shrinks to zero as n goes infinity because LXX goes to infinity. And so your ability to estimate a population mean at any x is going to get better and better and better if your model fits, like if your linearity assumption is correct and you don't have any omitted variables. Um, it's going to get a better fit, better prediction of the mean as n goes to infinity. Now for either of these estimands or quantities that we want to estimate, the form of the confidence interval is the same, but the standard error that you plug in is going to be different. So our confidence interval for an individual predicted mean or an individual response is going to be of the form of the predicted mean at that x, plus or minus the t critical value, which might be something like 2, um, times the appropriate standard error. The confidence interval is wide if n is small, if subject-to-subject -subject variability is high, or if you're far from the center of the data. So what's an example of using this kind of reasoning? Uh, is a child uh, of age x smaller than predicted for her age? Well, for that particular goal, you might be using the standard error of y hat. Uh, on the other hand, if you wanted to know what's the best estimate of the population mean blood pressure for patients on treatment A, uh, then you would use the standard error of E hat of Y given X, which is going to be uh, smaller. Here's an example of what pointwise uh, confidence bands look like. Let's say we had this really simple data set with seven observations. Here's the X values. Here's the Y values and we're going to get uh, uh, least squares fit to that and we're going to get predicted line and we're going to get confidence bands and you can see that our data points are shown with the dots the least squares estimate is going to minimize the sum of uh, squared errors from the line and measuring the distance vertically the um, yellow shows our predicted line and then the darker confidence band is a confidence band that's a point-wise 0.95 confidence band for predicting the mean of y given x, whereas the lighter shading gives us the confidence band for predicting an individual uh, data point um, for uh, a given x. Now we turn to assessing goodness of fit. There's various things that we need to look at, including linearity, constant variance. Uh, independence is hard to look at. That's usually from the study design. Uh, and then we need to have normality to get the proper statistical inference and to have very efficient estimates. Uh, least squares uh, may not perform well if you have non-normality. So there's some uh, ways we verify the assumption. We look at a scatter, gram, scatter diagram and we look at the spread of y. Uh, that spread should be, that vertical spread should be the same uh, across all the x's. And that can be easier to see if you plot the residuals versus the predicted value. And then we need to see no systematic pattern. We need to see just pure noise. A trend in central tendency would indicate a failure of linearity. And then for normality, we do a QQ plot. A QQ plot is essentially looking at the uh, cumulative distribution function, uh, empirical CDF, and taking the normal inverse transformation and looking for a straight line. So these are our predicted values or fitted values versus the residuals. And we're seeing here uh, an expansion of variability going across, which is really not uh, to our liking. That's supposed to not happen. Here you have the variability uh, the residuals are systematically high, uh, 
uh, then they get low and then get high again as if we shouldn't be fitting a straight line. Uh, this is what uh, equal variability and no real systematic trend looks like. So our assumptions look a little bit better there. This is a QQ plot, which we want the circles to be on the straight line. And how do you judge the adequacy of the fit of the straight line to this? It really is very subjective. We would be moderately concerned, I think, looking at this uh, QQ plot, a little bit worried about normality there. I uh, might want to use semi-parametric regression to dispense with some of these. Uh, so this is just uh, a first look at the uh, diagnostics that we use for simple linear regression. And um, we're going to be looking into um, some uh, useful equations. These are just mainly reference for you, which we'll briefly look at at the start of next session. But next session is going to spend time especially on uh, introducing multiple regressions. So hope to see you next time.